hiking in Colorado through some old train tunnels with a friend, not far off from a fairly populated area. The train tunnels were fascinating, blasted out of mountain with some quite long, requiring headlamps, but definitely wouldn't want to be there alone. We eventually dead-ended so backtracking the way we came. As we exited one tunnel, there was a severed deer head in the middle of the path that wasn't there the first time we walked through. Not a recent kill, but still fully fleshed. On our way into the area, there were some tents that were clearly used by homeless individuals, maybe 150 yards off the path. We took it as a clear sign we weren't welcome and needed to leave immediately. I always try to be on high alert, but this is not only because I'm often in the woods, but then I'm also often by myself. And people are known to do some pretty dumb things out here. I want to be out here to keep them safe. For the most part, this is routine. People, though, for the most part, are generally well-behaved when they're out camping, but sometimes things can get weird. On this occasion, it started off as normal enough. I was by myself, patrolling the campsite during the night, not really expecting anything to happen. I was looking up at the sky and I saw something that caught my attention, but whatever it was was moving along the tree line. I didn't think much of it at first. I assumed it was maybe some sort of animal or bird, but as I watched, it became clear that it wasn't an animal at all. This was some sort of hideous creature, probably not an animal I've ever seen before. It was tall and gaunt, long arms and a very thin frame. I could make out some sort of hair, but it was too dark to determine this thing's color. It had a long snout like that of a wolf or a dog, eyes that glowed dimly green. Its legs were incredibly long, and so the stride was almost comical as it walked away. I was terrified beyond belief by its sight, but I didn't want to show myself until it came closer. Even though this thing seemed to be headed towards the campsite, I couldn't leave everybody at my site vulnerable. I waited until about 10 feet from the camp before I stood up from my hiding place, firing a shot into the air. It stopped dead in its tracks as if it were confused as to what I was doing. I think it also realized there were humans at this campsite now, and we were all very vulnerable. It paused for a moment before it turned and ran back the way it came towards the tree line. I fired another shot, but this one missed. I was too panicked to aim properly, and I got away with whatever mischief it had in mind. I woke up the rest of the campers, told them what had happened. I only saw it for a few seconds, but it's burned into my memory like a brand. That thing, whatever I shot at, was pure evil. I never went out patrolling alone at night ever again after this. I was packing supplies into a shelter on the long trail. I was 10 or 11. I got 10 bucks for it each time I did it. I am coming back out and I hear a dog barking. I think cool. Someone is hiking with their dog. Then I hear another dog bark and another and another until there were about 20 different voices and I felt the hairs on the back of my neck go stiff. They could not have been much more than a couple hundred yards away. I knew there was no way to avoid or outrun them, so I climbed the nearest pine tree I could get to. I was up about 20 feet when this pack of wild dogs arrived and proceeded to circle the tree, occasionally following my scent up the tree trunk. Then they decided to try and wait me out. Only one person knew I was packing in, and he wasn't going to be home until 10.30 at night. So we waited. All I had was a buck knife and a wrist rocket, so I made the wait as painful as possible. When I ran out of rocks, I used pine cones, small green ones. I may have peed on them a few times too. It was dark when they decided to leave. I walked home after collecting a handful of stones, met my dad on the road going home, never so glad to crawl into bed.
My dad was a professional land surveyor, and I would work for him on weekends or during the summer. We were doing some work in a large conservation area and had parked the truck in a wide path that was supposed to be only open to environmental police and such, but there was obviously illegal dumping. We were going back to the truck for lunch, and when we stepped out onto the path near the truck, it was surrounded by at least half a dozen bikers who had broken the driver's side window and thrown all the gear out looking for stuff to steal. We were about 50 feet from them, and it felt like hours of silence when one of them said to the others, He saw us, they can identify us. I was 11 or 12, I don't really remember, but I was old enough to know what he was insinuating. My dad stepped in front of me, made a gesture with his hand that was holding his machete a common tool for land surveyors, and said, We didn't see anything, we're just working. Now I know for a fact my dad was capable of hurting people, even his own kids, and he could scrap. After a long pause, they backed away, got on their bikes, and left. My dad had us pack up only the important or expensive gear stakes and property bound stayed and drove us out of there in the other direction. I've never seen him be that reckless with a truck, before or after. With we got to a nearby convenience store, my body and mind completely drained of adrenaline, and I lost it. I couldn't even stand. I couldn't believe those people were going to kill us just because we caught them breaking into our car, but they absolutely were. My dad was a shit person. He was abusive and mentally ill. But there were a few times he showed he didn't hate me, and that was one of them. My ranking was Staff Sergeant E6, and I was in charge of a security firewatch platoon. We handled perimeter defense on the flight line and security at the Squadron Operations Center. We also managed the odd green sheet patrol on base after dark, looking for would-be intruders. This part of my story occurred back in the 1960s. I served with the 8th Tactical Fighter Wing at the Yuban Air Base in Thailand. At the time, I was a replacement airman fresh from the USA and not long in country. The squadron to which I was assigned had just turned over almost all of its aircraft to the 388th TFW, which took our F-4DS, including my platoon's aircraft, and sent us back to the USA. My unit only had five F-4CS left in the country, so I was not going anywhere soon. I had some time on my hands. We were on the flight line about midnight, minding our own business when an airman came screaming out of the night, heading toward us from across the flight line. I thought he was a fire marshal or an airman on fire watch, checking to see if anybody was out by the flight line. I couldn't understand why he needed to run, though. He ran up to us and was gasping for breath. He told us that we had been on fire watch during the flight line and he saw something out over the end of the runway 1 and 29. He said it was a bright reddish-orange object that came in from the west, slowly across the field to the east. It hovered for a short time above an aircraft revetment area before slowly drifting out of view to the south. He said he stood in disbelief for a few seconds until it came back out from behind some trees. He said it was this time it slowly moved toward him and hovered over Building 7357, also known as the AGE hangar. We refueled our aircraft with JP-4, he said. It looked like a huge fireball with a greenish-bluish hue glow around it. He said he could see rivets in the object and what looked like a dome on top. It was about the size of an F-4C, which was about 53 feet long with a wingspan of 38 feet. He said the dome was about 20 feet in diameter and it had some kind of windows or ports on each side. He said it had stayed there for a short time before slowly turning to the south and disappearing behind some trees. We radioed flight control about our Firewatch Airmen's report, but they said they had not reported anything unusual. They told us to keep an eye out for anything suspicious, but there was nothing else until about an hour later. 
There was an airman on duty at the AGE hangar who had just relieved his replacement. He radioed flight control, and he thought there was a small fire inside the AGE hangar. At first, they did not believe him. There were no reports of any aircraft being in the area. After about five minutes, they told him to call us for assistance. When we arrived, our firewatch airman was already there and said that he had seen the object in question, that it was hovering over the AGE hangar when he first saw it. He said it came out from behind the trees and was hovering over building 70 and 357 like before, and he saw it for a second time. There was definitely something strange going on. We entered the hangar and saw a glow in the corners. We pulled our fire extinguishers off of our jeep and headed into the hangar. It was still too dark to make out much, but we could see a reddish-orange glow emanating. We could feel the intense heat even though we were only 50 feet away. The section chief was already in there with his extinguishers and managed to knock down the glow. The fire was coming from a 12-foot deep vent in the floor, which was shielded by a steel grate. The fire marshal went over to the hot grate, and it became red hot when he touched it. We all stood there in disbelief. We would later learn that the fire marshal had already pulled up the two great sidebars when he first saw the flames. We called flight control, and they sent coverall crews to help us with opening all the aircraft revetments to see if there were any fires in the adjacent aircraft. We found nothing that night, but it turned out to be a very eventful one for all of us. We never reported our lights in the sky sightings to anybody else that I know of. But the next morning, while eating breakfast, I informed my wife that there was a bright reddish-orange object in the sky heading toward Grand Forks AFB from the west. I never saw it, but she said it was very bright and that it appeared to be a trail of some kind behind it that was warping space and time. These were her words. I don't know if the sighting had anything to do with the fire in the AGE hangar that night, but I feel it is important enough to report this incident after all these years. I'm an old soldier now, retired from the U.S. Army after 20 years of active duty with two wars under my belt. I am also a former member of the U.S. Army Security Agency and was honorably discharged as an intercept operator. I would also really like to know if anybody else has had similar sightings or knew of this happening at Grand Forks during the 1960s. I hope somebody out there in the UFO community reads this and can shed some light on this very strange incident in my life. Back in 2016, I was in Virginia, and my mom had gone through a pretty messy breakup. At the time, but we made the most of it by doing what we did like hiking. She introduced me to her friend and her husband and children. Which one was a female my age cute girl? Off topic. It was a trail in the Blue Ridge part of the Appalachians. That day we were going to do old rag, but got there too late. During some points, we would all be split up and sometimes I would be way back or way front. With this experience, I was way in front of everyone, even the dog. Off topic again. One part of the trip, we had stopped and rested at an overlook. Then we went on our way. We were about another, I say, 15 to 30 minutes into it, and I was way ahead. I remembered warnings from signs my mom, her friend, her husband, and another person that there was bears. But what I heard that day wasn't a bear. It walked on two legs and I was too far in front of everyone for it to be them. Besides, I would have heard the dog walking too since the cute girl was walking it behind me. I felt the sense of being watched when I heard the leaves crunching I believe in Bigfoot and the paranormal and I'm up for suggestions on what it was. It could have been Bigfoot or the rake I'm into all that folklore. I've got more stories that I want to share, I just gotta get my internet shell off. My ex-husband may have seen a skinwalker one night. He worked the overnight shift in the big city of Santa Fe, New Mexico. 
Well, Santa Fe is bigger than the small village we were from that had two lane roads to travel to get to the main highways. He would leave our house at 10 p.m. to get to work by 11 p.m. One night I got a frantic call from him when he arrived at work. He sounded almost hysterical. He said he was driving down the usual road to get to the highway and came up to what he thought was a cow sitting in the middle of the road like they do sometimes. He slammed his brakes on and honked his horn, annoyed that he was going to be late. He waited a bit and honked again and the cow stood up, and but he realized it was standing up in its hind legs. Then he realized it wasn't a cow. Maybe it was a coyote or wolf. He then saw that it was a naked man as it turned to face him, but the head was of a dog. The creature slammed its hands on the hood of the car and then bound off into the hills in three steps. He couldn't make out where it went, but my ex said he drove as fast as he possibly could to get out of the area and to the well-lit highway. Once he arrived at work twenty minutes later, he called me nit making much sense. When he calmed down a bit, we both tried to make out what he possibly could have seen. Even years later, we'd talk about it once in a while, maybe a dog man, maybe a drunken man wearing a mask. It wasn't until years later we came up with the possibility of a skinwalker. Maybe it was just some distortion of the darkness and headlights during late night driving. Maybe he was hypnotized by the driving, but he still thinks he saw something out of the ordinary. I've been avidly having nightmares of someone being in my small town living trailer for quite some time. I had nothing of it to actually say anything. Until now. A week leading up to this, I had a sleep paralysis moment where I've seen someone in my house and a co-worker stabilize me because I had a seizure in my dream, I think. Because I was convulsing foam and shit like a regular seizing victim. I remember my ex that used to live in this place by herself, saying she used to have nightmares and dreams of a person breaking in or being here. I never had resentment to that statement because we're Navajos. In the following months, I've been having nightmares of someone in my home. I'm always in a sleep paralysis moment. Until the other night, I see a person's silhouette from both windows and began to panic because it's at both front and back door. I called my parents and grandma but get no answer. So I called my aunt and she picked up the phone, questioned whatever was going on, and I explained to her the events. Now at this point I'm mad because it's causing me stress. So I told her I'm going to go outside and fight it. She told me otherwise and stay inside. The incident took place in November 2012. The gas station was a lonely building just off the highway and was the only service station for miles around. It was around 3 a.m. and the attendant was going about his normal duties when the power suddenly went out, plunging him into darkness. Using his phone as a makeshift light, the attendant made his way back to the backup gas generator and switched it on. The backup lighting came on, but only the parking lot and the hall to the register were lit up. The rest of the gas station remained in darkness. The attendant figured that the bad weather was probably to blame for the power outage. That was until he saw something moving at the edge of the darkness. He watched intently for several moments, eventually making out what looked to be three children riding bikes. Almost as soon as he saw them, two leaped from their bikes and made their way over to the gas station. They stopped at the doorway and stood staring at the attendant. Now a little unsettled but still not overly concerned, he made his way to the door and opened it, asking the two children if they were okay and stating it was late for such young kids to be roaming around near the highway. One of them, a young girl, asked him if she could use his phone. As he handed her his mobile phone, her eyes met him, and the attendant saw that they were solid black orbs. No, the girl snapped, I need the real one, motioning to use the landline phone in the gas station itself. At this point, 
Fear finally overtook the attendant, and he pushed the door shut and locked it in one move, shouting as he did so that the girl should go home. The children stared at the attendant through the window for a moment longer before turning around, getting on their bikes, and riding off into the darkness. The following morning, the attendant told his boss of the ordeal and requested that he go through the security cameras. However, they had been off due to the power outage. It is not known if the power going out was connected to the black-eyed kid's arrival, or if it was just an unusual coincidence. I lived in Lac du Flambeau, Wisconsin in August 1994. Seven of us were joyriding in my dad's car, and I was driving. It was about 10 p.m. on a summer night. We came up to a stop sign and noticed that there were what we thought were kids playing on the swing sets at the grade school, which was about half a block away. I pulled up at the school and whoever it was was gone. I pulled up into the horseshoe drive all the way and that's when we saw it. Hovering above the tree line, I could see the outline and the color was white. There were two white lights at each end of the wing tips. Everybody started to scream and holler, go, go, go. And then the third light lit up. Kind of. It opened almost like an eye pupil, like dilating. The light was an orange color. I floored the gas pedal and we spun out of there quick. I didn't hear it make any noise because we had a little boom box in the car. We were listening to Metallica and the song Green Hell was playing, plus everybody screaming and crying. We went to my friend's house and she told her dad about it. He grabbed a flashlight and we went back. He went into the woods and found nothing. He went home and we all went to a local pizza place, told other friends about it, and drew pictures of what we saw. We all saw the same thing. It was getting late and the pizza place was closing. So I went to go start the car and it was making a horrible noise. Like if you were to keep turning the ignition when the car was already running. Everybody took off running like it was going to explode. My friend's brother opened the hood and unhooked the battery. Had to leave the car there and walk home. I have never been so terrified walking home alone. When I got home, my dad wasn't home, but my mom was. I told her about it, and she didn't say anything. I heard my dad come in later that night, and he was angry, telling me I better go get his car. My mom told him that we had seen something, and he didn't believe any of it. I couldn't sleep all that night. In the next few days, I heard that there were other sightings, not in the same place, but within a few mile radius. I guess that I should add that the school was on a lakefront and that one of the other sightings was above a lake. I didn't have the best relationship with my uncle. It hadn't always been like this, though. I remember my childhood and how we'd spend a lot of time together. Sometime after I turned six, though, he suddenly went dark and his visits nearly ended completely. He used to come around about once every two months, and then out of the blue, I was lucky to see him once every ten years. He had nearly become a distant memory when I received a phone call from him asking for me to visit him. I was going to say no, but he then dropped the bombshell that he was dying. Years of smoking had caught up to him, and he didn't have much time left. He even offered to pay for my flight. My uncle lived on a ranch far removed from other people. I think his closest neighbors lived about 20 miles away from his patch of land. He seemed to enjoy it this way, and I had wondered about it before. I would soon find out why. I knocked on the door, and it opened to reveal the smiling face of my uncle. He was far removed from the memories I had of him, just barely recognizable, but that's what ten years in cancer do to a person, I suppose. He invited me to sit down and we exchanged a few pleasantries and general chit-chat. My uncle had brought out some snacks which I had enjoyed as a child. I honestly didn't like them as much now that I was older, but I didn't want to say that and just thanked him. 
It was after an hour that he got to the meat of the matter. Now, nephew, he said. He actually used my name while talking, but I don't want to reveal it, so I'll just replace it with nephew for the sake of this, and I'll address him as simply uncle. Are you still big on the whole saving the rainforest thing, all right? Um, yeah, I still want to help protect the environment. I've started a project to help save a type of frog within South America, and there's this big, my uncle raised up a hand. Sorry, I would love to hear all about it. I did love your stories back when you were little, you had such a vivid imagination. Honestly though, I never thought that you'd actually embark on a journey to become a real environmentalist, but I'm glad you did. Nephew, I don't have a lot of time left, and so I want to get straight to the point. He took a deep breath. Do you believe in monsters? Monsters? I asked, confused. Yes, my uncle said. Monsters. They exist. You might not believe in them now, but you will once this is over. I don't understand, I said. Let me ask you another question. Do you believe that every species on Earth has a right to be protected? He asked. Well, yeah, I said. And if you had the power to save one of them, would you? Why, yeah, I would, I said. My uncle relaxed a little. He then got up to get his rifle. Do you know how to use one of these? Yeah, Dad taught me, but I've never actually used one of them in a dangerous situation before, I professed. You probably won't need it, but take it anyway, he said. I'll explain what this is about, but I need you to come with me somewhere. We then spent 15 minutes hauling supplies to the back of his truck. All in all, it was probably enough to last someone several months, and I was honestly confused as to why my uncle would need that much. While he drove me to our destination, he started talking again. Do you believe in Bigfoot? Sasquatches, he asked. Bigfoot, I said and laughed. The town where I grew up had had a Bigfoot sighting ten years ago. It wasn't all too famous outside of it, though, and I doubt anyone outside of our town has even heard of it. Well, you see, when you think of stories of ape men or the like, my uncle continued, you'll know that the Native Americans also had similar stories of seeing such creatures. That seems to tell me that they probably are real, but that leads to another question, of course. Why haven't we ever found one? It's said that at one point, the population of humans on Earth was only 10,000, but we bounced back from that. If we assume that there are even one-tenth that amount of them around, only a thousand, we should still have found traces of them. Dead bodies, excreta. There should be videos of them migrating for food, but there aren't any and all you can find is very bad grainy footage occasionally. So they're not real then, I said with a shrug. My uncle shook his head. There's an easy answer to that paradox. The reason we haven't found them was that they were hunted to near extinction by people like me. I was waiting for the laugh indicating that this was a joke, but it never came. It was after my stint in the army I was looking for work and I was an experienced hunter to boot, and so some suits from the feds came round to try and recruit me. They said that I had to hunt a kind of ape, and I needed the cash at the time, so I agreed, my uncle said. I never really found out why it was that the government wanted them gone, my uncle said. Some of the other hunters had their theories. Some said we were harvesting their organs. Others said that we were going to clone them to make super soldiers. Some people thought that the Bigfoot was actually more advanced than us and would threaten our position as the dominant species on this earth. I have a far simpler theory. We hunted them because we wanted their land. Bigfoot tends to be rather docile most of the time, but they are also very territorial. Some people must have died at one point because of them while encroaching on their land, and the government realized that we had to wipe them all out. Of course, this isn't the 1-800s, and if the public got wind of it well, it would be bad so the project was kept hidden. I was pretty good at it, my uncle said. I had a total of 339 confirmed kills. I never thought anything of it at first. 
I just thought I was hunting any other kind of animal. Until one day. I was all alone tracking two of these creatures when one of them almost got the jump on me. I managed to kill it with a lucky shot, thank the gods or else I wouldn't be here today. The other one ran away and I went after it. I was able to finish it off twenty minutes later and I followed some of its older tracks to a small enclave in the woods. His hands began to shake a little, and I offered to drive. No, it's fine. I had never seen a child before then. A child Bigfoot that is to see. Well, a baby animal was still an animal after all, so I raised my gun when it did something none of them had done before. It spoke. I had heard roars and growls before, but never actual words. Two syllables. Mama. It said them again and something else and began wailing. The way it said that it kind of reminded me of you, nephew. He smiled fondly. I know you can't remember, but I remember holding you in my arms while you spoke your first words. You were so adorable back then. His smile vanished. It was then that what I was doing hit me. I wasn't saving humanity from some rabid animals, I was wiping out another species which was maybe as smart or even smarter than us, my uncle said. I never mentioned what happened to anyone else, but I quit sometime later. I'm sorry I wasn't around more while you were growing up, I secluded myself here. I had too, he said, and then stopped. We had arrived at a small clearing. He handed me the rifle and got off the truck. There's something I haven't told you. There was a reason some of us thought that the Bigfoot was superior to us. They have a special skill, so to speak. At first, we thought they had some kind of telepathy. But no, they're able to communicate with a special type of sound wave that travels for hundreds of miles. It's at a frequency humans can't hear. But once we used special equipment, we were able to detect it. That's why it's so hard to find them once you encounter one that one will contact every single other one in a hundred mile radius and tell them to run. My uncle pulled out a strange flute. You know what a dog whistle is, right? This is kind of the same thing. Up till then, it had occurred to me that this might have been some sort of elaborate joke. My uncle wasn't really a prankster, but maybe he had wanted to make me laugh one last time or something. That, or maybe the medications were interfering with his reasoning ability. He played something on the flute, and nothing happened for ten minutes, even though my neck kept turning at the slightest sound made by the forest. Every twig snapping or bird chirping nearly made me jump as the suspense dialed up to a crescendo when I finally told myself to relax and take a deep breath. And then I knew that my uncle was perfectly sane and hadn't been telling me some weird story. Out of the corner of my eyes, I saw a dark figure emerge. Now you've probably seen some footage or drawings of Bigfoot. I'll say that many of them are reasonably accurate. You're looking at something about eight feet tall, which is very ape-like. That is to say, except for the face. That face was surprisingly human, and it made me wonder how it was that my uncle kept killing them without a bit of remorse for so many years. It had a strange way of walking and paused after taking two steps. It pointed a finger at me. Who is he? The words were deeper than any other voice I'd heard and a little garbled, but the meaning was clear enough. He's my nephew, my uncle said. He then pointed to his truck. I got you all I need, but I'm dying. I won't be around for long. He then turned to me. I, I hope he'll keep taking care of you, but my time here is up. He began to cry, something I'd never thought he'd do. If you want to kill me, you can do it now. A chill went down my spine. I was the one who killed your parents. I think you know that, my uncle continued. You might as well take me out of my misery now. The thing raised a hairy fist and I raised the rifle reflexively but my uncle put up a hand to stop me. This is what I want. I hesitated, and that was a fatal mistake. Even if I wanted to, there was no way I would have reacted in time to save my uncle. But no killing blow came. 
Instead, the thing pointed a finger at my uncle and said, Mama. Tears flowed down my uncle's face like a faucet. After all this time, I helped my uncle who was sobbing, so it was really me doing all the work, unload the supplies, and we drove off. What was that about? I asked him angrily. Were you really going to let it kill you? It's a he, my uncle corrected. And I have done so much wrong, nephew, throughout my life. Raising him was just a partial atonement for my sins. I know it isn't enough. I can't even walk into a church and confess my sins to anyone. He then paused. I am sorry, though. I didn't want to drag you into this, but someone needs to keep supplying him with food. I keep him hidden, but if he goes out to forage for food, he'll be found some day, and this place isn't big enough for him to live off the land. Why this rifle then, I asked. Because, my uncle said, I was worried that he might try to kill you as revenge instead of me. After all, I killed some of his family. He might have considered that to be fair, but I wouldn't let him hurt you. Of course, I was completely wrong. I was thinking about what I would have done, but he isn't like me. He's much better and bigger of a person than I am. It was then that I realized what my uncle had been talking about earlier, the monsters he spoke of. He wasn't talking about the Bigfoot I had just seen. He was talking about humans. Part of it must have been about himself. Most of it must have been about the other people who had organized the hunt for these creatures, who still walked the earth freely with no guilt in their souls. So what do I have to do? I asked. My uncle's eyes lit up a bit. Will you do it? Will you take care of him for me? My uncle said that he would leave his investments totaling $12 million hunting Bigfoot apparently paid very well as well as the ranch. It would be more than enough for me to keep the place running. I could even hire some helpers to work on the ranch, though he advised against it as some of them might talk. My uncle died three months later. I was with him when he passed away as he couldn't confess his darkest sin to the pastor. He confessed it to me instead. For the last four years, I've been running this place mostly smoothly. Something strange did happen the last time I went to supply him. Behind him, I saw two shadows. One was a bit shorter than him, and one was even shorter than me. It appeared that he had found himself a partner, and even a child. Where had they come from? Most likely he had signaled to her using the special call he had. The two of us didn't talk too much but I did tell him I was happy for him. He smiled back and said, Thank you, brother. For many of you who enjoy hunting for Bigfoots, not in the sense that my uncle did, of course, I just mean people who like searching for signs of Bigfoot. I have a message to pass on to you all. Don't bother, you'll never find them. They know to hide from humans. Many, if not all, of the sightings you hear about are just hoaxes. I even have the suspicion that many of the hoaxes are done by the government to discredit true sightings. But I know that I can't solve this problem alone. If people don't know what's happening, the few remaining ones will be killed, and I can't save a species like this. I need to get the word out to let the public know what the government's been doing behind your back, and we can't let them continue. I have devoted lots of time to saving these creatures but I can't do it by myself. Already, I know many of you will dismiss this as a tall tale, but for those of you who do believe, remember, the best thing you can do for these creatures is simple. Leave them alone. In case you do find one or think you saw one in the area, maybe you could leave something to eat for them, but it's doubtful that they'll come back to that area. After all, even I wouldn't trust humans after what they've gone through. I ventured deep into the heart of the secluded Idaho forest on a solo hunt, determined to track down elusive stags that had long eluded my grasp. The dense woods were shrouded in a cloak of shadows, the sunlight struggling to pierce through the thick canopy above. The scent of damp earth and pine needles filled the air, 
a familiar and comforting presence that grounded me amidst the solitude. As I followed the path deeper into the woods, my senses sharpened, attuned to the rustling leaves and the subtle shifts in the wind. The anticipation of the hunt surged through my veins, mingling with a quiet reverence for the untamed beauty that surrounded me. Each step was deliberate, each sound carefully weighed against the backdrop of nature's symphony. And then, as if emerging from the depths of the forest itself, I saw it a figure unlike anything I had encountered before. It stood tall and imposing, walking upright in my direction. My heart quickened, and I instinctively sought cover behind a nearby tree, my breathing shallow as I peered out. I turned to cast a cautious glance in its direction, my pulse pounding in my ears. The creature was closer now, just about ten feet away. Its form was shrouded in darkness, an enigmatic silhouette that defied easy description. Its build was sturdy, slightly shorter than my own, and it moved with an unsettling grace that sent shivers down my spine. I strained my eyes to discern its features, but its necklace head remained obscured, devoid of any visible features that I could make out. It paused by the very tree I was using for cover, its head tilting upward as it sniffed the air, like a predator catching a scent on the breeze. The absence of visible eyes only heightened the eerie sensation that gripped me. Fear rooted me to the spot, my muscles refusing to obey my desperate pleas to flee. I watched transfixed as the creature's attention shifted away from me. With a casual nonchalance that sent a shiver down my spine, it turned and walked away, fading into the forest like a specter melting into the shadows. In a surge of both desperation and disbelief, I raised my rifle and aimed it at the retreating figure. The gunshot shattered the silence, the sharp report echoing through the woods. I watched as the bullet streaked toward the creature, impacting its dark form. But to my shock, the bullet seemed to bounce off its skin, falling harmlessly to the ground. The creature didn't flinch, didn't react. It was as if its very flesh was impervious to harm. A sense of bewilderment washed over me as the creature disappeared from sight. My thoughts were a jumble of confusion and wonder, grappling with the inexplicable encounter that had just unfolded before me. Slowly, I lowered my rifle, my hands trembling as I tried to make sense of what I had witnessed. Hours later, as I returned home to the waiting embrace of my wife, I found myself at a loss for words. Her eyes sparkled with curiosity and warmth, and she asked the question that I had anticipated, did you hunt anything today? But I remained silent, the memory of the enigmatic creature still vivid in my mind. I had ventured into the heart of the forest, seeking to conquer nature and claim my prize. Instead, I had come face to face with a mystery beyond my understanding, a reminder that the wild places of the world held secrets far stranger and more wondrous than I could ever have imagined. I'm not sure if this is the appropriate time to come forward with this story, seeing that the recent events in Japan are still fresh in everyone's memory. I have been a follower of your podcast. Naturally, your podcast was the one I thought of first when this incident happened, and I decided to write in and tell you what happened that night in early February. I was in Japan on business and had emailed a lifelong friend who was living in Japan and teaching English at a local school. He had insisted on my staying with him for the duration of my stay, saying it would help save me money and make my expense report look better when I turned it in. My friend I will call him Tim for the sake of his reputation and career was a lifelong bachelor and had a fairly large apartment all to himself and his cat. After several days of day-long meetings and group seminars, we decided to go out to get a bite to eat and take in the town. After a fairly large meal and hopping from one night spot to another, we decided to go toward the ocean and check out the moonlight reflecting off the waves. My friend stated that he wanted to check on a biology station that some of his graduate students had set up near a large power plant. As we approached the plant from the west, 
We walked along some paths and came to a simple metal box bolted into the ground. From this box there were a myriad of weather vanes and other meteorological devices. My friend stated the school's science class students had a theory that just like the water being used and discharged by the power plant was warmed by the production of electricity, the air around the plant was also being warmed and thus affecting weather and tidal patterns in the surrounding ecosystem. It all sounded too complex, and in my slightly tipsy and tired state, was only able to grasp the bare bones of the complex theory he laid out. He finished up and changed the subject to something more jovial, when all of a sudden we heard a loud and distinct whoosh. At first, my mind thought it might be the sound of the distant waves crashing ashore when we heard it again, followed by an ear-pitching screech that shook me down to the bone and made the hairs on the back of my neck stand on end. We looked around for the cause of the noise when we heard the sound again. The best way I can describe it is a city bus break when they are in need of service, loud and ear-splitting. We both continued to look around when my friend's attention was drawn toward the plant by another nearby couple. A younger couple, out for a walk, were staring toward the plant arms outstretched and the obvious fear in their voice showing itself. I looked toward the plant, and against the lights of the plant, I thought I saw a figure silhouetted against the moonlit sky. The figure was large and black. From the distance I was at it looked to be sitting on top of one of the squared-shaped buildings. It sat there for about five seconds, then it unfurled a large set of what I could only describe as large black wings. The only reference I can compare them to is from the old John Travolta movie Michael, where the main character unfurls his wings and spreads them out to their full length. To say that this creature was large was an understatement. The creature then took flight and circled the plant at least four or five times. Some circuits he took at a fast pace, some he seemed to slow down. All the while he kept his attention on the row of square-shaped buildings that I later found out housed the reactors. The creature then came toward us, flying at least 25-30 feet off the ground. The younger couple who had noticed the creature first were now screaming and cowering, the man shielding the woman while shielding his head with a jacket. My friend and I looked in awe as this creature flew over us. That's when I noticed the two large red eyes. They seemed to glow from within and with a blood-red hue. They were unblinking in the three, four seconds we saw them. We knew they were looking straight at us. We knew this creature knew we could see it, and it made no attempt to disguise itself. The sick, intense, and overwhelming feeling of dread came over us. A feeling that we shouldn't be there was, to say the least, overwhelming. As quickly as it came, it flew away, back toward the town, eventually melting into the black night sky, and as it flew away from us, a loud whoosh was heard again, and then, silence. This lasted a second or two before I heard the sound of a shutter and turned to see my friend trying to take pictures with his cell phone, but all he got was a dark nighttime sky. We went straight home, and my friend bolted the door and drew all the blinds. He was shaking and saying that he could not believe what he saw, could it have been a large, unknown species of bird? He kept mumbling to himself until I was able to calm him down and get him to relax and talk about what we had seen. Eventually, we both agreed that it must have been some sort of large bird, or maybe an optical illusion caused by the lights given off by the plant on a regular, known species of bird. We talked about it late into the night till we both fell asleep on the couches and awoke the next morning to stiff necks and backs. My friend and I spent the last two days out and about and enjoying each other's company, till he drove me to the airport and we bid each other farewell and I came home. We spoke about it only once more in an email about a week before he was due to come to the U.S. for his sister's wedding. When I brought it up at the wedding rehearsal dinner, he was convinced that it had been an optical illusion. That was until the day before the wedding when he woke me out of a deep sleep with a frantic phone call telling me to turn on the TV. There came the images of the devastation of the Japanese earthquake and the near total destruction of the city of the town of Okuma, 
where my friend was living and working. On the day of the wedding, the news came of the explosions at the local nuclear power plant, and as CNN broadcast the report, we were both aghast at the same power plant where we had seen the strange bird-like object not being shown on the television set. The Fukushima Daiichi was the exact same plant we had seen the strange bird-like creature circling. Was it pure coincidence, or was it the mythical Mothman doing his strange work of predicting disasters? I may never know and may go to the grave wondering that, but one thing is certain for sure. I don't think that either of us is going to forget this event, no matter how long we live. I'm kind of an avid amateur photographer, and one night around 4 a.m. I was out alone in the Firehole Basin region of the park. The goal was to take a long exposure photo of a geyser erupting, with the Milky Way stretching through the sky overhead. The photo turned out to be pretty much a bust. When geysers erupt, they blow massive amounts of steam into the air, and steam kind of blurs that whole beautiful night sky situation. But anyway, I parked my car and hiked a ways to get close to the geyser I wanted to photograph. Then I set up my tripod, adjusted all the settings, and waited for the eventual eruption. The night was crystal clear, perfectly quiet, and very cold. As my ears grew accustomed to the lack of sound, I gradually realized I could hear the gentle burbling of the spring that gives birth to the Firehole River some distance behind me. I could hear wind in the trees and leaves rustling across the ground. In front of me, I could hear rumbling and hissing from deep within the earth as the white dome geyser worked itself up for another inevitable eruption. An owl hooted somewhere above me, and I could even hear the distant howls of wolves across the bowl of the Midway Valley below. As my eyes grew accustomed to the darkness, I could see the Milky Way stretch like a river of light from horizon to horizon overhead. A million billion stars shined above, brilliant and cold. Orion hung over my right shoulder, and Venus burned just above the horizon, so bright it almost hurt to look directly at it. And then behind me, loud and sudden, the pounding footsteps of a giant. Clearly coming right at me, bear, Bigfoot, some hideous monster, born in the hell of a geyser's boiling mouth, spewed upon the land to wreak vengeance? I didn't know. But I knew it was coming, and I knew it was close. The buffalo actually brushed against me as he went past. I was frozen in place, resigned to my fate. A huge bull, a mountain of fur and horns, shambling up out of the darkness, steam billowing from his nostrils in the cold, dry air. It felt like a close encounter with a freight train. He strode past like I didn't exist, seemed to tiptoe gently around my tripod, then stopped about ten feet in front of me and took a long, slow, very satisfying, steaming piss on the ground. Then he grunted and went on his way. And I stood there wondering how I was going to take a photo, if the geyser blew before my hands stopped shaking. My encounter occurred in Golconda, Illinois on June 15, 1991 at approximately 2.30 a.m. That night I thought I dreamed about several aliens coming into a cabin I was staying in with my girlfriend. Early the following morning I awoke and described to my girlfriend my strange dream. She went on to tell me that she had the same dream and that she had been taken to a spacecraft out in the field that was near the cabin. In my dream, I was awoken by three five alien greys. Their featureless faces were only illuminated by the reflections from their black eyes. I remember sitting up in bed, holding the covers up to my face so that only my eyes were exposed. They came towards me, and one seemed to be holding some strange jewel-encrusted wand. It was gold and had red and green crystals that may have been used to control the device. I think it was this device that was used by the aliens to disrupt my memory of the events. The next evening my girlfriend woke me up very late at night terrified. She said they were back, 
and she did not want to do with them. Immediately I became aware of a very low-frequency humming that was coming from somewhere outside. Here is where it gets strange since it was a waking memory, and I remember it as a waking memory. My actions at that point on seemed bizarre and irrational to me. I went out onto the porch to see if there was anything. There was a very bright light shining through the trees that separated the space around the cabin from a large overgrown field. It was at this point I think the aliens again used their minds or my own brain was just going into shock over seeing such a bright light shining from this isolated field. We were miles and miles from anything. The cabin we were in had no electricity and no water and the closest neighbor was several miles down a dirt road. It was like my rational mind kicked in to convince me that what I was seeing was not real. I thought it could be some kids on a TVS, or we were hearing the sound of a faraway generator, or that someone was simply playing a joke on us. From that point on, I can't remember much. I don't remember going back to the cabin. The next day, I woke up early in the morning and went out to the field to see if there was anything. Out where the bright light seemed to be emitted from there were eight concentric circles pressed into the grass and mud. These were not like crop circles, but appeared as if something had pressed into the ground. The outer circle was approximately 40 feet in diameter. This incident occurred on Wednesday 20, April 2016 at approximately 8.30 p.m. in Zygi, Cyprus. My two friends and I had just finished our meal and were out in the garden talking and drinking, not alcohol. One of my friends had gone into the kitchen to refill their glass, whilst I and my other friend remained outside. After a moment of silence, my friend pointed out an unusually bright star moving across the sky, assuming it may have been a comet or something. After a brief moment, I looked up at it again to realize that it was stationary, around 75-100 feet above the tree line. I sat there, staring at this thing, just in complete shock. Every 15 seconds or so it would lower its altitude until it was only a couple of feet from the treetops. The weirdest part about this is that absolutely no noise had been emitted thus far. I tried to get out of my chair to hurry inside, but I felt an overwhelming feeling of paralysis, as did my friend. I turned to her and asked her what was going on, but she looked frozen in fear. After what felt like hours, something appeared from around the trees underneath the triangular craft. It was a humanoid figure with a head similar to that of an ant and skin like a crocodile. It had extremely small eyes in proportion to its head and long, thin appendages. It walked right up to the fence before sharply turning and sprinting into the darkness of the trees. After a brief moment of complete fear, dread, and anxiousness, the craft moved in a linear path towards the west before becoming no longer visible. During this time, my friend who had gone to refill her glass watched the entire event through the window. She recalls, although neither me or my other friend do, that the creature had some sort of device in its hand and that it held it up briefly before its disappearance. I do not know why it came to us or to where we were, but I can tell you it is the first time I have ever witnessed this or heard of this happening in Cyprus. I am describing my first experience that I can remember here. I believe I was 15 years old. I had gone to bed that Saturday night probably between the hours of 10 and 11 p.m. I lived in Cambridge, Ontario, Canada. My bedroom was on the top floor of our house in a turret. There was a single bed on either side of the room which was in the shape of an octagon. I woke with a start and looked over at the other bed and saw my cat sleeping there. He always did. I then looked at the clock radio which had been acting strangely over the past few weeks. It had been turning itself on and off all by itself, usually around the same time at night. Perhaps I had gotten so used to it that's why I had woken, but the time on it said it was 12.15 a.m. 
I tried to roll over and go back to sleep. Suddenly I found myself paralyzed on my back, unable to move. There was a tall being beside me to the left. The right side of my bed was up against the wall. This being was also a shadow, but its eyes glowed white. It began to communicate with me via ESP. I was somehow able to communicate back with it the same way. I do not remember everything. I do remember it asking me if I wanted to join it on its ship. Then suddenly the craft appeared by the window and green, greenish blue, and violet lights were flashing from a silver disc like UFO that was being operated by others that were in the room with me. It hovered there for several minutes. During this period of time, the shadowy being took what was to me its index finger and touched me on my solar plexus. I then woke in a start. My cat was not on the other bed and the clock radio said it was only midnight. I thought I had experienced a bad dream. The following morning I went to get into the shower and on my solar plexus was a marking. It remained there for a number of years and was very sensitive. It comes and goes now. When that spot on me is touched I feel as if endorphins are being released. I have had other experiences since this one such as sightings of strange things in the sky and being paralyzed in bed. Seeing strange lights flash in shadows. However, none were quite like this. I also had some inorganic materials exit my body only several months ago which I am not comfortable showing to a doctor. I worked as a police officer in the town of Nakudoshis for around eight years. I loved it there. A lot of people don't see why I enjoyed it so much, but that town had really brought me peace after many rough years. That peace was completely disrupted one day, though. There are many trails in Nakudoshis. Most of them are completely tucked away in thick trees and brush. It was my day off, and walking those trails was one of my favorite things to do. At the time, I had been divorced. I'm ashamed to admit that I wasn't a very good father in those years. I hadn't seen my children in years, and I had made very little effort to be part of their lives. It's a terrible thing to admit to, and I have many regrets, but that's the kind of man I was at the time. I had picked out my trail for the day. It was one that I hadn't walked yet, and I decided I'd go exploring. For some reason that day, my children were on my mind. I remember that it bothered me because it made me feel guilty. It was kind of a bummer to feel that guilt on my day off. In hindsight, I was probably thinking about them because some part of me knew that I was in imminent danger. The first thing I noticed was that the trail was very quiet. It seemed unusual. Normally, I'd come across at least one other person while on my walks. That day, I hadn't seen a single other soul. It didn't bother me too much. But it did tell me that I needed to be more vigilant for snakes and other dangerous creatures. I had stopped for a drink of water, and I was leaning against the wooden rail that lined the trail when all of a sudden the hair on the back of my neck stood up. I hate that feeling so much. I don't really know why it happens to us, but it's never a good sign. I lowered my water bottle and listened carefully for any kinds of sound. I couldn't hear anything, but I couldn't shake the feeling that I was being watched. Suddenly the space around me felt way too quiet. I looked toward the direction I was going as I contemplated whether or not I should carry on with the trail or head back towards my car. I made the logical decision to head back towards my car. It wasn't far along the trail, so I knew it wouldn't take long to get to safety. As I walked, the only sound I could hear was the sound of my own footsteps, and it completely unsettled me. Then something stopped me dead in my tracks. It was a light thudding sound and it was coming from high up in the trees. I stopped to look. I scanned the trees, but heard and saw nothing. I decided to stay where I was for just a moment and listen. Then I heard the thought again just to my left. It was as if something had landed in the tree. I looked up at the tree, which was covered in red and orange leaves. I focused hard on the leaves, searching for a large bird, or maybe a squirrel. Then... Slow movement caught my eye. Something massive was stalking me. 
I couldn't see it clearly, but it had long limbs and it climbed through the branches sideways. It seemed to be keeping me in its sights as it moved gently through the leaves, barely rustling the branches. Then I saw part of its face. Two saucer-like eyes stared at me from between the branches. It seemed like minutes that we stared at each other. Not once did the creature blink. It seemed to be patiently waiting for me to look away. I was frozen with fear. I could hear nothing but the sound of my heart beating in my chest. Then seemingly out of nowhere, more hikers stumbled upon me. They were noisier than I was. They had a Bluetooth speaker that was pumping loud hip-hop music and they were laughing and joking. It scared the creature away. It took off along the trees, moving faster than any animal I'd seen before. Those other hikers will never know that their obnoxious behavior had saved my life that day. All I remember thinking was that I was going to die without ever seeing my children grow up. As soon as I got back to my car, I phoned my kids. That experience changed my life for the better. Still, I never want to be that scared again. A few friends and I decided to go for a cruise. We drove by my girlfriend's house. They were doing renovations and no one was living there. And she let out a guise. Guys, look. Oh, my God. The window. So I looked at the second-story window and the hair stood up on the back of my neck. It looked like an absolute giant of a man. Very tall. Very broad. With wire-like. Matty hair. The house had a light on, but it was dark. He stood there like a silhouette. A hulking, menacing silhouette. My friend in the front started praying out loud. The driver nearly crashed from all of the commotion and how loud we were. I instantly thought it was some squatter or homeless guy. Whatever, but they were convinced otherwise. I don't believe in the paranormal or anything like that, but seeing that thing gave me the chills like never before. I was instantly frozen with fear. We stopped at our friend Craig's house, and he instantly had to check it out. We were back at the house not ten minutes later. Craig looked at me. Come on, let's go. What are you crazy? Serious, just no, F that. He wouldn't let up, and I had to go with him to check this thing out. He said it was because no one else would, and because I was the second biggest. Now, Craig was six feet seven and 280 pounds. Just a mountain of a man. And we were only 18. I still didn't feel safe. I felt like a six feet two little girl going in there. We walked up to the house, click, the door was open. It wasn't even locked. Bizarre. The stairs were at the front of the door, and I was first. I'm slowly creeping upstairs, trying to not make a sound. It is worthless, as the mammoth behind me is stomping up the stairs. Or so it seemed. The guy we would have seen would have been to the left in one of the rooms. I went to the right toward the kitchen and told Craig he wanted to be here. Go check it out. It's pitch black. The hallway light wasn't working. The only light on is the one in the kitchen, where I am. He's walking down the hall, and all I hear is Jamie. I'm so tense it scares the shit out of me. I jump. What? Hand me your phone. I need the flash. I walk to him in the hallway, past the stairs, to give him my phone. He gets it, starts using the flash, and I walk away. I'm just turning my way into the kitchen when we hear boom, thump, 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 thunk, crash. Every hair on my body stood up. I whipped around and saw Craig in the hallway looking pale and frozen. I probably looked even worse, and we were both frozen for only a few seconds, but it felt like an eternity. What? Are you messing with me, Biss? More sounds? No, shut the F up, I hissed. Then dead silence. Both of us realized we had to get down those stairs. It's the only way. The same stairs we heard something tear down as fast as they could. We both ran at the same time, and I had to wrestle the mammoth that is Craig down the stairs to get down first. I scrambled my ass off of the door and just barreled out of there, not looking back. And that was that. Or so we thought. We got back to the car, and both probably looked like we had just seen the devil himself. What's wrong? It looked all good from here. 
My girlfriend, Anna asked. We explained what went down, and everyone in the car looked at each other and wouldn't say anything. What? What? I asked, no one answering. Just what the FAS spit it out, shouted Craig. Finally, Anna spoke up. She said they thought it was all good from the outside. She saw Craig and I using a flashlight in the room, and i that was being a creep behind the door. They thought I was trying to imitate the thing we had seen. I'm not kidding at this point. I could feel my eyes tear up when she spoke those words. I was nowhere near the room at any point. Someone was in the room when he didn't even know it and must have been the person who tore out the there and bolted down the stairs. He would have been right behind me as I passed the stairs. This was two years ago. Edit. Sorry for the length, but it's a true story, and I had never typed it up. Two weeks later, the contractors found dead animals mutilated in the basement. Hearing that made me relive that nightmare and wonder what sick person we had stumbled upon. Chills. This happened in Ohio, about 15 miles north of Delaware, ruralish area. I'm being vague because I don't want to give too many personal details away. It was summer and my family was having a cookout. All the adults, including me, are inside talking while the kids were playing outside. We all heard a huge boom, to this day the loudest sound I think I've heard, and no shit about three seconds later. We all kind of froze when we heard the boom. Felt the wavelength or whatever from it go through the house. This kicked us out of our shock and we ran outside to see if the kids were okay. What happened? It honestly sounded like what I would imagine a nuke or bomb would sound like. The kids were fine. Some were scared, some didn't hear it. UTF. And we didn't see anything in the sky or around the land that looked off. My boyfriend and I drove around like two miles out in each direction and saw nothing. I've checked news reports off and on, and nothing's been said about it since then. It was so scary, and the fact that nothing was said about it in the news is just so weird. There is no way it was just a gunshot. Some of my family tried to say it was after we all calmed down, or anything like that. It was something big, and it's going to drive me nuts for a long time if I don't figure out what it was. Many years ago, I spent nights with a lady friend. She had had trouble sleeping, so she started taking Ambien. One night, she woke up trying to unlock her apartment door with her car keys from the inside, went to the doctor, and got off the medication. In the meantime, she needed someone to stay with her until the meds wore off. So picture the two of us young adults snuggled up in a twin-sized bed in her apartment and me not letting her all of 90 pounds. Get up and walk around while tripping balls on Ambien and Ambien withdrawals. I woke up in the middle of the night to a presence in the room and there is a small child standing beside her side of the bed. I turn slightly and can see the same child standing behind me, opposite the first. Thoroughly creepy. No, then they disappear. Maybe I'm tripping too, right? Except I'm straight, except I'm straight. Whatever, my mind is playing tricks on me. I woke up before her the next morning, started to get up, and found the sheets were tucked under the mattress clear up to our necks. So I laid there until she woke up and watched her, and I watched her struggle with the bed sheets. Now, I'm a light sleeper, and we never slept with the bed sheets tucked under the bed. In fact, she was pretty anal about making sure the sheets were loose. So I asked her about the sheets, and she described, paraphrasing ten years later, a boy of seven or eight years of age that visits her in the night, and I quote, He tucks me in. So far, he's been harmless. It was summer. It was hot. And I still shivered. Most people haven't heard of Worth County. That's because it's very small, and I'm one of the few police officers in that county. It's one of those places where people are a little too afraid to date each other because the chances that you're some kind of cousin is pretty big. Most days, things are very quiet. 
although I'll admit we have some issues with drugs. Some people who are in recovery like to come out to the smaller counties to recover, thinking that moving away from the big city will help them heal. What they don't consider is that there's nothing to do. That can often lead to their addiction worsening instead of them recovering. We have one problem citizen who's a severe alcoholic. He's a young man, mid-30s, but he's been through a lot. Every now and then he drinks himself into a stupor and we get phone calls about all sorts of strange things that he's imagined in his head. For instance, one time he called us to tell us that his neighbor was spying on him. He could see him in the kitchen. When we arrived, we discovered that the drunkard had thought his neighbor's house was his own. And he was sitting in the neighbor's living room. Most of the time, we throw them in the drunk tank and let him sleep it off. I'll be honest, I'd be relieved if he ever moves away. Sure would make this place a little quieter. Anyway, one night I was working alone, as I often do. It's a small enough population that it's okay for that to happen. The man called in and said there was something scratching on his front door. He sounded different that night, though. He wasn't slurring as much as he usually did when he called in. Made me feel kind of uneasy. But as is my duty, I had to go out and check it out. The uneasy feeling didn't go away, though. And I called my colleague asking her for a huge favor. She agreed that she'd meet me there, even though it was her night off. I suppose as police officers, we never really get a night off. I arrived before my colleague, which was to be expected as she still had to put on her uniform. The first thing I noticed when I approached the house was that there were, in fact, scratch marks all over his front door. So I slowed my pace and checked out the surrounding area. I couldn't see anything. I was largely looking for eyes that reflected the light in my flashlight. There was nothing, so I continued toward the door. The scratch marks looked pretty deep, and I did consider for a moment that he used a knife for something to carve them into the wood. I knocked on the door, and the man yelled for me that it was unlocked. It wasn't until I stepped through the doorway that I considered that it, perhaps, was a trap. He was a wild enough character to do something like that, but it was too late. He was already approaching me. His eyes were wide and he was completely pale. I asked him what had happened and he told me that he heard a loud bang on his roof and that something had been scratching on the door. At that point, my colleague arrived and I filled her in on everything he told me. She kind of had an unsettling look in her eye and she pulled me aside. He's completely sober, she said. When I looked back at him, I realized she was correct. What's worse, he looked completely terrified. I was on my way back to talk to him some more when there was another bang on the roof. That's the same as last time. He said the color drained from his face. My colleague and I armed ourselves and walked slowly out of the house. It was pretty dark outside. He had very little lighting on the outside of his house, so we relied on our flashlights to help us see. We were still looking toward the roof when a loud thud sounded behind us. We spun around just in time to catch the back of a large creature as it scampered away. I don't know what it was, but it was about the size of a bear. Only it was thin and had no fur on it at all. We didn't move. We were completely unprepared for a creature of that size. When we were certain that it was gone, we called in animal control to search the area. They didn't find any creature, but they did find footprints which they wasted no time casting. When I asked them about it, they explained that they were completely stumped. They showed me the castings of the footprints. The creature had large tracks that looked more like hands than paws or feet. Each finger had the longest talons I'd ever seen. It was truly terrifying that night, and the drunkard, he never had a sip of alcohol again. I'm a female, and this occurred two years ago when I was 18. This takes place in Maine. Every summer, my family and I go up to camp in Dedham Millsworth, Maine. It's about a three-hour drive from my house. The camp itself is about an hour from the nearest town. I've been going to this camp my entire life. My family owns it and have never had an incident like this happen before. I was watching TV in the middle of the night. Both of my brothers and my parents had gone to bed. I heard a noise coming from the kitchen and realized that the dogs needed to go outside to do their business. 
So I took my brother's two pit bulls and my affin pincher, tiny dog, outside after turning on the porch light. I walked around to the front yard and I let the dogs off leash. It's so incredibly dark in the woods in Maine that the porch light really only illuminated the porch and nothing else. So I tried to keep an eye on them. I was momentarily distracted when I saw a loon, wild bird. On the lake, when I looked back, I saw that the pit bulls were both looking at something in the woods. I couldn't see what it was, but I assumed they'd seen a squirrel or a raccoon. It was then that I realized I didn't see Alfie anywhere. She's an awfully small dog, and she's completely black. I called for her a few times and heard some soft whimpering right where the dogs had been looking earlier. I took a couple steps in that direction and called for her again, worried that she may have gotten her paw stuck between the rocks or gotten stuck in a snake hole. Suddenly, I felt something moving behind me. I whipped around and looked down, and it was Alfie. She'd been staying close to me the whole time I just hadn't seen her. So naturally I was thinking, if Alfie is here, what if he's in the woods? I took another step forward, and the pit bulls began to growl. They were slowly advancing and were now on either side of me, looking right into the blackness of the woods. I quickly picked up Alfie and began to back up, very slowly. I'm not sure what I thought was there, but there were lots of animals in Maine, and I figured the dogs knew better than I did, since I couldn't see anything. Right as I turned around, I heard the most absolutely bone-chilling thing I've ever heard in my life. Coming from the direction of the woods, I heard something, someone call Alfie's name. It sounded almost as if it was trying to mimic me, but it was just all wrong. The voice sounded really distorted, and it almost seemed to wail. I freaked the F out and ran inside with the dogs. I have no idea what was out there in the woods. My camp is essentially a log cabin overlooking a lake, and our nearest neighbor, who is also family, lives at least a half mile in the opposite direction of where the thing was. What do you guys think? I was working early one morning on a Wednesday. At that time, I'd been a police officer for a little over ten years. I was in a good mood that morning because I was expecting some potentially good news about an upcoming promotion. In fact, everyone was in a good mood that morning. I was eager to do my job and go home to my family. My day changed dramatically when the phone rang, though. It was an old friend of mine, and she had called me directly. She sounded exhausted and a little incoherent. But when I asked her what was going on, she explained that she hadn't been sleeping. We'll call her Megan for this story. Megan told me that she'd been waking up every night from sounds coming from the basement of her house. At first she assumed it was rats or skunks or something. But then she said the previous night. The noises had gotten so loud that she was certain there was a person sleeping in her basement. Reports like that are never good to hear. It's a surprisingly common event where vagrants will break into someone's basement and live there for weeks on end stealing from them and causing all kinds of damage. The real danger is if someone gains access to the main house. Megan lived alone at the time, so I immediately agreed to come over and take a look. I wanted to make sure that whatever was happening in her basement would come to an end. She asked me to come later as she was going to work. It sounds odd, but she wanted me to hear what she was hearing. She said that the sounds never happened in the daytime. So if I came over at night, then perhaps I could catch the person, if it even was a person that was living in her basement. I agreed, but it left me feeling uneasy and concerned all day. That evening, she let me know when she was on her way home, and I went to meet her at her house. She offered to cook me dinner while we waited for the sounds to start back up. I was in an even better mood, as I had learned by that point that I'd gotten the promotion that I was after. So we had a little celebration. At around 10.30, I heard the first sound coming from downstairs. She stopped and told me to press my ear to the door. So I did. I could hear a fair amount of shuffling. It wasn't very clear what it was, but it was definitely too big to be a rat or a skunk. I told her that I was going to slowly open the door, but when I did, it made a loud sound and I could hear crashing in the basement. 
I ran down the stairs with my weapon drawn, but I stopped dead in my tracks when I switched the light on. What I found was what looked like a large nest of some kind. There were branches and feathers and dried leaves all piled together in the center of the room, and it stank like nothing I'd ever smelled before. The window was broken, so whoever it was had left. I told her to stay at my house for a few nights and then arranged for some trail cams to be put up in the basement so that we could catch whoever was down there and have sufficient evidence. After a few days, I went to retrieve the trail cams and watch the footage. Megan was sitting next to me at the time. What I saw completely blew my mind. A large animal with long, thin arms and legs climbed in through the window. It behaved similar to a large ape, only I'd never seen an ape like that before. It brought with it more items to add to the nest. I know for a fact that apes don't make nests. In fact, most animals of that size don't make nests. It walked on its two hind legs, like a human, but was hunched over the entire time. It had a large rib cage and large ape-like hands, but I remember noting that it had no ears and seemed to have no color on its skin apart from one large black spot on the back of its head. Megan was freaking out and asking me what to do. I had no answer, for I had never encountered anything like that before. So I gave the footage to my superior. When he watched it, his eyes stretched wide. The next thing I knew, I had a non-disclosure agreement on my desk, and the footage was confiscated from my possession. Megan was also forced to sign so that she couldn't speak of it. She said that men with suits had come into her basement, and when they were done, there was nothing left, and her entire basement had been boarded up. She never really felt safe in her home, though, and wound up selling it a few months later. It was a sad day as that home had been in her family for generations. But whatever security she once felt there had been stripped away by whatever creature had decided to nest there. I didn't experience these sightings myself, but my mom and cousin brother did. These both happened on the Omaha and Winnebago reservations. So my mom was on her way back from the store in Winnebago, and it was evening kind of dark, and she saw something crawling from the ditch. She said it looked like the Gollum dude from the Lord of the Rings trilogy. Its eyes were reflecting. She didn't look back at it because she was driving. Okay, the second one, my brother cousin, was driving these people around drinking. He was sober. I think this was on the south of the Omaha Reservation country roads, basically just trees and fields. And he saw this thing walking on all fours across the road. It had pale skin and had like a long nose, like those anteaters anyways it crossed, and they sped by everyone in the car saw it. But they didn't seem to get scared, so yeah, I just thought I'd share these. I live in western New York, as stated. A little background. At the complex my fiancé and I share is heavily populated. Lots of houses on the outside of the property as well, but directly behind our building is a very large section of dense forest. When we first moved here three years ago, we used to go out there to smoke joints and such as we didn't want to on our back deck. Shortly afterwards, we decided the woods were no good, so we would just smoke on our deck. So anyways, I have had two very strange occurrences in the last two weeks. Also, I don't know if it was a crawler that I saw or heard, but I figured I would post here and see what everyone's opinion is. Anyways, about two weeks ago, I'm out on my deck patio. We live on the second floor, and there's a staircase leading up to the door that takes you up the stairs to the third floor and whatnot. And I'm smoking a cigarette. It's about three, and I hear a bunch of rustling at the far end of the parking lot behind our building out in the woods. So I look over there, and all I hear is this loud screech. I assumed it was some type of animal at first, but it kept walking a few feet and then screeching. It did this repeatedly until it was almost in front of me, but still in the woods, if that makes sense. At this point I feel like something someone is watching me, so I walk down into the parking lot, and as soon as I did I hear the screech, but even louder this time moving towards me. I ran as fast as I've ever run in my entire life back up the steps into my apartment, shutting and locking the door. About ten minutes later, I open the glass door. We have a screen door on the very outside, and I still hear the screeching, but even further down and deeper into the woods. 
I haven't heard it since that night. I really don't believe it was an animal because I've lived relatively secluded most of my life at my dad's house, and I heard animals and bugs and all that all the time, so I don't know. It was just really weird. The most recent event occurred last weekend. I was dead tired after I got out of work at 11, and I was out on the deck smoking again, and at some point I fell asleep in my chair out there. So I wake up, it's about 3.30, and I stood up, stretched, and then lit another cigarette. Well, at this point, I've shaken off the sleepies, and I'm kind of just scanning the tree line. As I'm doing this, near the far right corner of the parking lot, we have those cattails, or whatever they're called, the tall grass shite. While looking, I lifted my eyes up because whatever was over there caught my attention right away. I swear, whatever this was, it was maybe seven and a half feet tall, kind of hunched over and just staring at me. I noticed no other features that stuck out, just long limbs and a blank face. As soon as I looked at it, it turned and kind of galloped into the mouth of the woods and was just gone like that. I don't know if it was a crawler or just an animal making me look stupid, but whatever it was gave me a creepy feeling. But that sums up my events. If I seem crazy, then do tell me so, because I'd rather that than be what it could be law. Let me know what you think and thank you. Update 823. So last night, between commenting on here and playing some games online with my brother, I was up till about four again. Well, around 3.30, I was out on the deck smoking again. Surprise, surprise. And I don't know, I just had a really uneasy feeling, so I put it out and went inside to get ready for bed. While going through and locking the doors, I heard a sound similar to what I heard the first time. I can't say it was the same thing, but it was very similar. It was very faint this time, maybe deeper in the woods, but I wasn't trying to stick around to find out. Also, I wanted to post a picture so you could see my paw from my deck. So here it is. I found out how to add the photos. Update 828. So the last week was mostly uneventful. Up until last night, that is anyway. I was gaming out and ended up falling asleep in my chair. Well, I woke up and it was three, so I went outside to smoke my cigarette before bed and realized I had left the door unlocked. Not that that's a bad thing. It's just... I've been super anal about keeping things locked after reading various stories on these subs. While I'm outside, I hear the same type of scream I heard the first time. Also coupled with the screaming, I hear brush breaking throughout the woods. I mean, it sounds like something is just shooting through there. Gradually becoming more concerned, I was turning to go inside when I heard this, I don't know, cackle. Is what you could call it. I mean, it was loud. I thought at first it could be a bug or a small animal or something, but it just kept increasing in sound to the point where I almost thought it was a laugh. It was so damn loud, I'm looking around to the other apartments and nobody was up or around. I proceeded to lock the door and triple check it before finally being able to fall asleep. I don't know what's out there. I don't really want to know, but there is something. Seems like lately more and more is happening, and I'm not too sure what to make of it. If anyone has any info on what I could have heard, please do share as I am genuinely curious and somewhat concerned. Update. So I posted my encounter on this subreddit a little over two months ago. For three weeks after my post, surprisingly, everything was pretty normal. No weird screams or sounds coming from the woods. But that changed about two weeks ago. I previously forgot to mention an incident that happened prior to the first sighting I had. A few weeks before I'd seen it, I was playing some games online with my brother. I had a noise-canceling headset on, so it was hard to hear my fiancé talking when she's standing right next to me, let alone hearing a scream for help outside. But that's exactly what I heard. It was the most loud, blood-curdling scream for help you could imagine. Think of the classic scream you'd hear in a horror movie. Spot on to what was heard. I heard it three different times within the hour. Naturally, I was alarmed and went outside on my deck and didn't see nor hear anyone anything. The weirdest part about it was that nobody else had heard a thing. I mean, I asked my neighbors and they looked at me like I had two heads. A few weeks later was the encounter. Fast forward to two weeks ago. I'd been hearing crashing sounds in the woods. Branches snapping and whatnot, which normally I wouldn't give a second thought to if not for my encounter. 
So I'm outside smoking my cigarette, and it was just around midnight. I hear a loud crash in the woods, directly in front of my deck. I try to just ignore the sounds of whatever I'm hearing out there, and it generally works. Not that night, though. I looked up and I seen what looked to be a human climbing out of the brush directly into my line of sight just outside of the tree line. At this point, I'm freaking the F out like what is coming out of the woods. I would have thought an animal, maybe even a real human, but as soon as my eyes focused, I realized that wasn't the case. Whatever climbed out of there was well over eight feet tall. I mean, it looked huge, upright on two, what I assumed to be legs, white, the contrast between it and the moonlight made it stick out like a sore thumb. It just stood there swaying back and forth while I stared at it. I could feel my heart thumping in my chest. I got a glimpse of it for about ten seconds before it scampered back into the woods, running exactly the same way when I first witnessed it. The very next night I'm doing the same thing, outside on the deck smoking around the same time, about eleven, almost midnight. I hear the same crashing sounds in the woods, followed by the same crushing of brush while something climbs up and out of the woods. It had to be the same exact thing I'd seen the night before. Same body type, height, color, movements. I mean, everything was the same. It seemed confused, unsure what to do. I feel like we looked at each other at the same time, because almost immediately after climbing out of the brush, it ran right back into the woods. I haven't seen it since that night, but I feel like I hear it running around out there every night. It's so weird, sometimes it's like it makes itself known, and other nights it can just silently move around. I always feel like I'm being watched when I'm out there after dark. It's like I can feel it in my stomach. So all in all, that's what's been happening in my neck of the woods. It's honestly very unsettling, as I don't really feel safe outside anymore. I'm sure a decent amount of my worry is paranoia, but it's hard not to be paranoia after everything that's happened. So I guess I'm looking. I had just gotten home from the gym and was exhausted. I badly needed to shower sleep, so I began to head upstairs. As soon as my bedroom door came into view, what I can only describe as a dark and humanoid-looking silhouette creeped out of view from the side of my doorframe. I knew 100% that I had seen something and wasn't too keen on investigating it. I grabbed a knife from my kitchen, convinced myself that I was a grown, ass man, counted down from five, kicked my halfway closed bedroom door all the way open, and started yelling like a maniac. I was home a one. I didn't find anything or anyone. I checked each closet thoroughly under the bed, etc. The usual, um, that places. I closed my door out of habit and began to get undressed when the only light in my room burned out. It was absolutely pitch black, considering how positive I was that I had seen something earlier. I promptly began to freak the F out. I had this sense of dread and absolute impending doom. I felt like there was a hand about two inches away from the back of my neck. It was such a vivid and terrifying feeling. I bolted in the direction of my door after about five, ten seconds of being too afraid to act and got the F out of my house until the rest of my family came home. Pretty anticlimactic, I know. But to this day, I've never felt that convinced of another unwelcome presence in my house. I worked for the National Park Service for three years. I wasn't out in the trees, though. Unfortunately, my story isn't going to be that exciting. My official title was Administrative Specialist. I helped organize government-funded programs and prepared written documents related to those programs. I was good at my job. I was fired unceremoniously 15 months ago. I wish I could say that my removal from the service was a mystery. I know exactly why they let me go. I saw too much. 12,307. Even though I know it's higher now, that's the number I remember. I couldn't scrub it from my brain if I tried. For eight months, the Science and Research Division of the Park Service was collaborating with an independent study group. I handled the paperwork for this partnership almost exclusively. 
waivers and DAS population registries for the fauna in our country's national parks. There were some odd additions for sure. Why were the members of the Park Service signing liability waivers? Asking those questions wasn't part of my job. I didn't know enough about the Science and Research Division to begin a debate with them either. I trusted that the Park Service knew what they were doing and tried not to get hung up on the details. Then the injuries began. I'm not sure when they started or how many people were hurt before I became aware of it. The first few incidents I know now only involved the study group that I mentioned before. Without members of the Park Service involved, I had no reason to be notified. When the first ranger returned from the Everglades with a broken leg, I started paying attention. The ranger was part of a team documenting the population growth of the Virginia possum. I'd never heard of a possum breaking someone's leg. I had to file the details of the incident, along with an insurance claim and a copy of the liability waiver signed by the ranger in question. That's how I knew the doctor had cited the source of the ranger's injury, as an animal attack. That's how I saw the pictures. The ranger was mauled. When I started asking questions, I was only reminded of their official position, documenting the population growth of the Virginia possum. There were three more attacks over those eight months. I knew by then not to announce my suspicions. Whatever was going on in our parks, no one wanted to talk about it. Instead, I stuck to the documents. When the research project concluded, it was time to bid our independent partners farewell. I had to provide them with original copies of every recorded incident related to their research. I did exactly as I was told. I prepared the pile of paperwork, and when I was asked to combine it with the folders brought into the office by the independent regime, I didn't hesitate. But I couldn't stop myself from peeking at their information either. The corner of one specific document was protruding from the edge of an unlabeled black folder. It must have come loose from the paper clip holding the rest of the folder's contents together. I tugged it along until I could read the heading. Unidentified species. I remember how cold I felt when I read those words. The sweat on my brow turned to ice. I didn't know that the Park Service was involved with anything involving new or unusual forms of wildlife. I pulled on the paper a little more. Information spilled out of the folder one line at a time. New Encounter 7. There was a range of dates alongside that number. Those seven new encounters had taken place over the research period that I was involved in. Injuries 9. The Park Service had only four documented entries. The other five, I suspect, belonged to the independent company. Why had they kept that a secret? Where were those injured parties? Total encounters, 12,307. My heart sank. There wasn't a range of dates next to that line. I didn't know how long this company had been studying unidentified species in our jurisdiction. Had the Park Service been involved from the beginning? Why weren't these encounters? These injuries are these new species being discussed with the community at large. I lost my composure after that. All discreet intentions vanished. I opened the folder where it sat. My eyes briefly passed over a collection of photographs. They looked to be screenshots from the trail cams. One of them was a Polaroid. In each picture was a shape that I didn't recognize. Animals for sure, mammals mostly. They were either moving too fast in the photos or my glimpse at them was too brief. But I couldn't decipher any of those species. A hand suddenly slammed the folder shut. He was a member of our science and research team. When he spoke, he did so in a hushed panic. He told me to forget what I saw and urged me away from the area. I later saw him handing the folder and my paperwork to a member of the independent party. They were scared when they caught me. I doubt that they were worried solely about my safety. I think the knowledge that I gained at that moment could have put the entire park service at risk. That's what's so frightening. What could they do to us, a government body, who has superiority over the park service in the parks that we manage? My termination arrived swiftly after that. I expected it to be accompanied by an end day, but there wasn't one. I guess the administrative specialist that they got to replace me overlooked that detail. 
I can't be punished for sharing this information now. Can I? I know that these parks are dangerous, they have been for years, but am I in danger too? When I was around 18 years old, I had been paying my ex-girlfriend, at the time, a visit and ended up losing track of time. It was around one in the morning at the time, in the dead of winter, I would say, maybe late January or February. Whilst relaxing with my girlfriend, I had neglected to pay attention to the weather, or even look out the window at the time, considering darkness falls in Lancaster County by around 4.30 on the winter time. A very intense snow squall rolled in and had developed into a blizzard. After I did realize this, as well as the time, I concluded that for some reason the smartest move would be to leave and make the around 25. 30 minute drive, even in clear weather, back to my house. Where I live is rather remote, the Amish capital of the world, actually if you are unfamiliar with Lancaster. But it is miles and miles of rolling hills, crop fields and woods, with several small towns scattered about amongst them. About 10 minutes into my drive, I'm having a very difficult time seeing through the endless onslaught of fluffy snow and the fact that I had left my glasses in my girlfriend's bedroom. I was driving at maybe 15, 20 mf considering the roads had not yet been plowed and were pretty slick. I got to a familiar portion of my drive about two or three miles from my old high school. As I'm creeping down the country back roads, I can barely make out some sort of color in my low beams about 20 yards in front of me. Curiously, I angled my front end toward the thing that I was seeing, which was also on my side of the road. As I got close enough to make out what I was seeing, I realized it was a hunched old woman. In some kind of blankets and a long skirt. Instantly, I was thinking this is my chance to be a good Samaritan and save a life. It was all of five degrees outside that night, and this old woman was very far into the nothingness of the land, with no known homes around. I crept up next to her and rolled down my window. At this point she was no longer being illuminated by my headlights and was alongside my car, maybe around six feet outside of my passenger side window in the heavy snow. My initial thoughts of this old woman must have dementia or Alzheimer's, some sort of neurological disease. I called out my window to her excuse, ma'am, are you in need of any help? What are you doing out here, you'll freeze? She didn't respond and, as a matter of fact, just kept slowly creeping forward through the snow. I used my phone flashlight now to get a little bit of a better view of her. She was wrapped in colorful blankets and had one sort of shrouding her head so I could not see her face. I also took note that it didn't seem like she had any shoes on. Once more I asked Mom, why don't you let me take you somewhere warm and we can get you some help? She stopped walking. I was already beginning to shiver just from the cold wind blowing in through my window. The snow was still coming down just as hard as ever. She just stood there facing away from me. Lady, can you hear me? I asked, not quite annoyed, but confused. Almost as soon as I finished asking this, a old woman swiveled toward my window and stood straight up. This tiny, decrepit old woman became a presence like I had never seen. Suddenly, the frail woman stood tall, taller than me, maybe six foot three or four inches. Her face was not hers. It seemed as though whatever it was had on a hyper-realistic old woman's masks and the largest, most soul-piercing baby blue eyes I have ever seen in my life. So large, in fact, it appeared like they were not even naturally possible for a human to have. But nonetheless, they were beaming at me from behind the holes that were vacant where the, the old woman's own eyes should have been. The sight took my breath away. Without hesitating, I accelerated my car and slipped a bit in the snow. Long story short, I ended up getting home after calling my ex and telling her to lock her doors. I mentioned it to my parents and they said it was probably some sick criminal trying to rob some sorry sucker like myself. I say to myself that is probably all it was but something about the almost animated movements it made. The way it seemingly added feet onto its height before my eyes, and its own eyes. I can still picture them so vividly all these years later. They were not natural. Whatever I saw out there surely would have succumbed to the elements 
and in a small town like mine, it would have made the news surely. I'm a believer in paranormal and ghosts and such, but that was a physical being. I just can't explain better than this what I saw, let alone give it a plausible explanation. I left my house for some grocery shopping. It was around 6.30, already dark outside. Right down the road from my house was a major vehicle accident. Three cars involved, all totaled and destroyed, with only one sheriff's deputy on scene. I stopped and offered to help as I work in search and rescue, and the singular deputy looked like he'd have his hands full. The deputy declined, stating the victims had already been taken by ambulance, and he was only waiting for tow trucks, which was a relief. But you could tell by his face it was a bad incident. I said bye and good luck and drove off. But I couldn't shake this feeling of dread. Just felt like it was eating at me as soon as I pulled away from the scene. Well, as I'm sure you've read in my recent posts, I've stated I live in a very rural area with thousands of acres of forests. After about five minutes of driving, I came up to a bridge I had to take a left turn on. Forests on both sides of the road. And right as I was making the turn, my headlights beamed across a humanoid face, and it ducked down behind the concrete guardrail almost immediately. But for a split second we made eye contact, and I got a rather good look at its face. It was very pale, gray in color, completely bald, somewhat wrinkly, no eyebrows or facial hair, no ears. Its eyes glowed bright white with a yellowish hue, similar to how a cat's eyes glow when light shines on them. I could make out what seemed like a sunken in nose and mouth, but my main focus was on the eyes, so I didn't get a good enough look at the nose and mouth to describe them. Its head was slightly smaller than a normal human, and its neck a bit longer. Normal humans, when trying to hide behind something, will duck down in a downward motion. Yeah. This thing didn't do that. Instead, it quickly turned to the right and threw its head forward to get below the crest of the concrete. At first, I thought it might have been some crackhead, but it just did not look normal at all. I turned around and pulled over to take a closer look with my phone light, but it was just too dark to see much of anything. The creature was gone by then. Fast forward a couple days, and every time I drove by that bridge, I kept getting the urge to have a look at it during the daytime to see how far it is from the guardrail to the ground, from where it was peeking its scrawny head over. It's a very steep incline that goes down to a quickly flowing river, at least a 50 degree angle. I stepped back and visualized where I saw its head, then had a look over the edge and immediately got a bad feeling in my gut. From the top of that guardrail to the angled ground below is around eight. Whatever this thing was, was definitely not human, and was either almost nine F tall, or somehow hanging off the side of this concrete bridge, with no arms visible. I have no idea what I saw that night, but I'll say this. I'm a city boy from Florida, born and raised there. While I have always believed in the paranormal, after I moved down here to the Appalachians with my family in 2020, there is just so much weird shit that goes on in these hills. I've had a few ghostly experiences from time to time throughout my life. But the shit I encounter out here is just a whole different ballgame. Thousands of acres of vast forests untouched by modern humans that could very well be hiding some freaky creatures we've never thought to exist. P.S. You may be asking why the vehicle accident is relevant to the sighting. Well, from what I've come to understand, supposedly these things feed off negative feelings and energy. My theory is that the dread I felt after leaving the scene of the accident prompted the creature to show itself. Or I'm just completely off my rocker and hallucinated the damn thing. That's a possibility, too. Beating myself up that I didn't have a dash gum running at the time. I remember the night, vividly. It was damp and brisk. We had just had a rainstorm, but it was one of those summer rainstorms that made everything warm but cold. You know the types where the wind is what makes you shiver. I had been called out to look for a dog that was roaming a neighborhood near the cemetery. The cemetery wasn't big, it was actually pretty small. 
but the dog had been scaring some people in the area. I was part of the animal control team. We had plenty of experience handling stray dogs, so it wasn't an unusual call. The only thing that seemed odd was that people said the dog was extremely massive. So to me, this sounded more like a wolf than a dog. But we can't really make assumptions. We were told to go locate the dog and bring it into custody. I hadn't been to the area before. It was a strange town that was very remote, but it was still a type of suburban area. I could definitely see why a large canine would be threatening to the people there, but I still had my suspicions that we were looking for something that was not a domesticated dog. My partner and I drove around the town. There were lots of small shops. Most of them seemed to be family owned. A couple of candy shops and ice cream shops and pizza, things like that. Truthfully was making me hungry. So I wanted to find this animal quickly so we could finally get some dinner. I remember telling myself that I'll have to remember this place because I'd really like to take a stroll around here on one of my days off. We didn't find the canine near the shop, so we started combing the neighborhood close to it. It was hard to see much. Many of the homes had plenty of bushes and trees. I wouldn't doubt if we'd been in the same vicinity as the hound. We just couldn't spot it. So we drove back and forth up and down those streets. We had spent at least an hour and a half doing this. We were starting to get a bit frustrated. That's when we got a lucky break. One of the people in the neighborhood must have seen us driving their streets aimlessly, so they flagged us down. The man said that he had seen the hound roaming near the cemetery on the south side. I asked him how big the dog was. He said that it was extremely large that its fur was pitch black and they noticed its eyes were glowing like a deer caught in the headlights of your car. We thanked the man and proceeded to drive towards the cemetery. The cemetery was very small, but it had plenty of large trees and bushes just like the neighborhood. It was getting darker, so things were made a little more difficult. It wasn't normal to do this, but my partner and I decided that we might have a better chance of finding it on foot. That way, we'd be able to scavenge around the bushes and trees and use our flashlights. We were both nervous. If the canine was as big as everyone said, we wouldn't be very safe out in the open. And if it was in fact a wolf like I had thought, we wouldn't be in a very good position with it. So we stayed close to each other. I did bring some things to our defense, whistles and things like that. We circled around the outskirts of the cemetery first. We just needed to get a good look around the perimeter before we went straight in. We didn't see anything at first. We just assumed that it might have left the area. But then, as we started to head back around, we see a black mass sitting in the middle of one of the streets between the neighborhood and the cemetery. And all I could smell was that fragrant, burnt smell of an old campfire. I yelled to my colleague, but I kept my front facing the canine. I didn't want to take my eyes off of it. At first glance, the dark mass seemed to be average-sized, but as I continued to examine it, I noticed that the canine was actually laying flush to the ground. It wasn't standing. My colleague asks if I think it's a dog, and I told him that I wasn't sure, that it was still a bit too far for me to make a proper estimation on the size of the animal. That's when the mass stands. It was indisputably large. Its eyes are glowing just as the man said, and it slowly walks to the neighborhood and disappears. It walked like we were not any type of threat whatsoever. It was smart, this animal. So we had to be extra careful. We followed the animal's path into the neighborhood. We looked around, but we didn't see it. But what we did see was a strange black smudge and it was very large in size, and it appeared to be on the spot where the hound was sitting. It smelled like charred wood, but there was no sign of the animal. It was getting really late. We were exhausted and hungry, but we knew we had to get this animal off the streets. But after following an animal that seemed to simply vanish from our sight, it seemed like we needed more eyes. We made our way back to the van, and I called for more assistance. We had another team meet us and we searched more. I had described the animal to the other team. They looked confused, but they didn't suggest that we had been fabricating anything. 
We searched well into the next day without ever finding another trace of the hound. Eventually, my boss called and said it was time to leave the area, that the animal must have moved to a new territory. We were never called back to find the animal, so I often wonder whatever happened to it. My family has around 360 acres in northern Oklahoma that has been in our family since the land rush. Growing up, the family would meet there for Thanksgiving and Christmas. But as the family expanded, it was quickly outgrown. Nowadays, I'm about the only person that goes there, and I go went there regularly to train with my firearms. I went there earlier this year and had an experience that shook me so badly that I haven't spoken about it until recently and will never go back there alone. I arrived around two and set up my targets, but something felt off. I use an electronic headset for hearing protection that also amplifies ambient noise, and I noticed that everything seemed to stop. No wind, no bugs, no birds, nothing. Just complete and total silence, which is very unusual for the area. I run my normal drills, and as the sun starts to set, things get stranger. Odd smells, like a dirty litter box of body odor, started coming around, and I noticed that the coyotes were crossing the field west of me almost as if they were consciously avoiding entering the woods nearby. Then, I started hearing interference coming over my headset, and what sounded like disembodied voices speaking in an indiscernible language that I couldn't hear with the naked ear. Now, I'm starting to worry. I start gathering my things, and I hear what sounds like a woman's blood-curdling screams coming from the woods. I've heard mountain lions and bobcats squaring off, which we do have on the property, but this sound was neither of those things. Around the same time, I got what I can only describe as a nauseating, omnidirectional feeling of being watched, shortly followed by very distinct footsteps trudging through the foliage in the tree line approximately 30 yards from my position. I've been an avid hunter since childhood and familiar with noises of the woods, and the cadence of the footsteps were indicative of a large bipedal creature, oddly human-like. Very concerning, considering I'm in the middle of a large swath of property that's 25 miles from the nearest populated area. I pull my phone out to take video, and I start scanning the tree line with my flashlight. Standing behind a tree at the edge of the tree line was a tall black silhouette with spindly limbs and a pale face looking directly at me. I managed to capture a great still image of it, from the video that I will try to find and attach. I quickly grabbed my range bag and made a run towards my truck. I get about 50 yards from the truck and the light post on our property that is hooked up to county power and has never turned off in the 20 years I've been going here. Suddenly cuts off. Now I'm blindly running in the direction I believe my truck is in while I hit the unlock button on my fob to find the lights. I get in my truck, speed off. And as I'm watching in the rear view, the light post turns back on. I wanted to share a story of an encounter me and a bunch of friends had back in 1968. To this day, I still think about it kind of hard to forget no matter how hard I've tried. Anything I say today must be understood as the words of someone only 11 years old. But I'll try to make myself as clear as I can. On a summer evening in 1968, an older cousin, a group of friends, and I decided to play baseball at a nearby baseball field. The field was about four to five blocks away from where I lived at 3,621 Richmond Ave, and the field was southeast from my house. Anyway, we all got together and were playing. There wasn't enough of us to play team-to-team -team match up, so we were rotating one pitcher, one fielder, and the catcher while the rest batted. There are some train tracks that ran parallel to the baseball field. I mention this because of what happened next. My time came up to pitch and my older cousin was fielding. One buddy hit a foul ball and it went over the fence towards the railroad tracks. By then it was getting a little past dusk, though. The field lights weren't too bad. There was a man standing close to where the ball rolled to a stop. My cousin ran towards the fence and yelled at the man to throw the ball back to us. He ignored my cousin, so I ran over and yelled as well. The rest of the guys came over and we started to cuss the guy out for ignoring us. 
None of us wanted to get near the guy, though. Something about him didn't feel right. One of the guys picked a rock and threw it at what we thought was a bum. The rock came close but didn't hit the guy. Then a group of guys started to throw rocks. That's when the crap hit the fan. This guy turned towards us slowly and dropped to all fours. What we all saw next by the dim field lights was not a man but a snarling wolf-like creature. My cousin was the first to react by yelling, Werewolf, and he turned and ran, followed by the rest of us. We ran as a group. Some were lucky and made it home first, peeling off from the rest of us one by one. My cousin and a friend ran to my house and spent the night. We told my parents what we had seen, and of course they blew us off. My mom told us what you probably saw was the devil himself for staying out past dusk. Being Hispanic, we always had holy water around the house. We blessed the house, and especially my bedroom. None of us slept that night, and any noise would make us jump. The next morning, we, all the guys, screwed up enough courage to go back to investigate. We found our ball where it had landed, but no visible tracks of anything else. Everyone but me agreed that we had seen a werewolf. I kept asking, how could it have been a werewolf if there was no full moon last night? Have dogmen sightings been reported near El Paso? And no, I don't want to be on your show or be identified. The very few people I've told over the years have either laughed at me or thought I was crazy. I'm an old man now, but I needed to get this off my chest. After college, I got a temp job working with local law enforcement. It was a six-month contract and it paid well, so I was glad to get it. I found a furnished apartment that let me rent month to month. It was on the top floor of a three-story building. It was pretty big and had nice hardwood floors. The walls were kind of thin and I could hear my neighbors sometimes, especially at night when it was quiet. When I first moved in, I knocked on the neighbor's door a few times to introduce myself but they never answered the door, even though I thought I heard them inside. I figured they didn't like answering the door if they weren't expecting somebody. Anyway, I slipped a note under the door just saying hello and giving my name. I worked with the same officers all the time on rotating shifts. After I'd been there a few weeks, I was on the evening shift, which meant I got home around two. One night, I was heading down the hallway of my building and saw light coming from under my neighbor's door. And I saw the shadow of feet under the door. It looked like the people had gone dark as if they heard me and were looking to see who was in the hall. I figured if they wanted to say hello, they would have opened the door, so I just kind of waved and went to my apartment. Over the next couple of weeks, this happened three, four times. It seemed like I had a reclusive but nosy neighbor. One night after work, I got into bed and heard my neighbor moving around in their room on the other side of my bedroom wall. The noises got louder and I started getting worried. They had never been that loud. And it almost sounded like they were being attacked or having a heart attack and knocking things over. I ran out and banged on their door, but they didn't answer. I called out saying I was worried and if they didn't answer, I'd call for help. Still no answer. I ran to my apartment and called the police station and asked my co-worker to send someone over. I headed down to the lobby to wait for the officer who showed up within five minutes. I'd gotten to know him a bit, and we went up and knocked on the door, but still no answer. I took him into my apartment, and we could still hear loud thumps every five or ten seconds and then a huge bang. The officer asked if I could contact the building manager to open the door. I called her up. Luckily, she was a night owl, and she was up watching TV. I told her what was happening, and she said she'd head over. She lived close by. She got there and asked which apartment it was. I told her 306. She looked at me weirdly and said 306 is empty. I said I'd heard my neighbor making noise almost every day. The officer said he heard the noises too and asked if 306 was the apartment that was above the carport. She said it was. He said someone could have climbed up onto the carport and maybe there were squatters in the empty apartment. The manager unlocked the door. The apartment was dark and she turned the light on. The officer went into the bedroom and came back saying it was empty. The place was spotless. 
All but two of the windows were locked, and there was no sign of squatters. We just stood there confused. The officer said, you're not crazy. I heard the banging, too. I said, maybe we scared them off and they'd left through the unlocked windows. We locked the two windows, and on our way out, I looked down and saw the note I slipped under the door a few weeks earlier. I said I'd let them know if the noises kept up. A few weeks later, when I was on the evening shift again, I got home about two and saw the light under the door of 306. I went into my bedroom and heard the thumping next door. I called for an officer to come out and call the building manager. A different officer showed up, and I knew him too. The manager arrived and unlocked the door. The officer went in and everything checked out. All the windows were locked. I apologized and tried to rationalize it, but there was definitely no good explanation. A few weeks later, the apartment was rented out and I got the chance to meet the new neighbors. I told them to keep an eye out because we thought maybe squatters had been getting in. I told them what had been happening. My last week there, the station had a barbecue and we were talking about the squatters that no one ever saw. I told the first officer about the second call and how the windows were locked that time. But I knew I'd seen the light on and heard thumping. He asked if I wanted to hear something strange. He said he was going to tell me earlier but didn't want to freak me out. He said that three months before I moved in, he personally responded to a call to my neighbor's apartment for a self-harm. The man had hung himself and was unconscious. It seemed like he might have panicked in a chair and lamp and side table had been knocked over, like he'd been kicking out in every direction. Unfortunately, he passed away before getting to the hospital. I just stared at him in disbelief. I asked the building manager about it the day I moved out and asked why she hadn't told me. She said that it was just policy not to bring up stuff like that. I don't know if it would have helped or not to be told about it, and I still can't even believe it. I was walking a trail nearby a major city with my friend at around 9.35. We were walking back to the parking lot after walking the trail. I didn't see anything at first. My friend was the one who pointed out. He said, I think we're being followed in a joking way, but then he said, we need to get away from that right now. There's something wrong with that. It ain't normal. I looked behind us and saw something really pale or wearing something bright white and running weirdly slow towards us in a janky, awkward way. It wasn't making any noise, but it seemed like a light was following it. It was illuminated from above, but there were no street lamps. It looked like it was running fast, but it was so slow that I was able to jog ahead of it and yell at it, and it still couldn't catch up. It obviously wasn't a person because of the way it moved and held itself. Its arms were weirdly at its side, and while it ran, its legs were spread in a weird way. It was still chasing us when we got to the parking lot. There was an old man with his dog who obviously saw it and looked terrified when he saw us running away from it. Another thing I should mention, a lot of crawler descriptions I've read here say that they're short and have long faces. But this one was super skinny and short. Couldn't have been over five feet. Honestly, I probably could have dropped kicked into the woods, but I was scared and running at the time. Anyway, the light and height makes me think it might not be a crawler, but everything else, paleness, setting, time of day, facial features, lines up and sounds like a crawler or ashman. I couldn't get any pictures or a video because I was trying to make sure my phone didn't fall out of my pocket while I was running. Anyone have an idea of what this might have been? I have three stories. First story... When I was seven, it was a very snowy early morning, close to Xmas time like it is now. I was walking hand in hand with my dad not too far from our apartment block when in front of us there was this very cool looking tall person. I thought before they turned around, with their huge black coat and gray, unruly, almost spiky hair. When we got closer, the figure turned around and had the creepiest stare and smile on its face. A huge smile and the whitest skin I have ever seen. I was in shock. We passed high, and I asked my dad if he saw how that man looked, and he said he didn't pay attention. I started telling him he looked like a vampire. I am from near Transylvania. 
He kept saying I have a very vivid imagination. I definitely felt scared and watched by the entity and will never forget it. Second story. At 14, I was walking with some friends at night, and when this car full of people lit up, like a family with their grandpa, except grandpa had a huge head, the size of half the windshield. He looked like he could be eight feet tall if not in the car. He had gray skin, white disheveled hair, and a trance-like stare. My friends didn't notice. The rest of the family looked regular. I was again scared. Third story. Then, at 17, I was walking with my aunt a bit further from her house when we noticed this couple staring at us. Yes, she did it too. A human-sized couple, female and male, similar in height to me. When we got closer, I grabbed my aunt's arm and said, Whoa, are you seeing this? They had the same exact face with creepy eyes and smile as the man had when I was a child. The two had the same face, despite one having long hair. Only these two had very yellow skin and deep under-eye circles. Ah, uh, gain black coats. Later, at home, my aunt said they looked like they were suffering from severe hepatitis or another illness that caused the yellow skin. She is a nurse and tried to make sense of it. Again, it was scary, and they were staring at us. I felt great, though, that she saw them, too. Has anybody had similar experiences? Another weird thing I saw when I was a kid was a person disappearing without trace from above in our app. My great-grandma pointed it out, and I was already thinking it. My encounter happened on March 15, 2019, in the Bighorn Mountain Range in Wyoming. It happened in a place people here call Lost Cabin Range. I was on a hunting trip with my friend John. We were both 27 at the time, and he got a bull elk tag from the draw that year. We drove around all day looking for the elk, and only saw one cow that had to have fell out of the herd when they moved through. It was starting to get dark, so we started to set up camp for the night. As I was hammering the tent, stakes me and my buddy heard what sounded like a woman screaming, and I mean it sounded like someone was being killed out in those woods. Of course, when we heard that we dropped everything we were doing and started looking around to see if we could find this woman, we were just about to give up looking when my buddy tapped me on the shoulder and handed me the binoculars. He pointed at the top of the ridge line closest to us. I grabbed the binoculars and looked at the ridge, and I about shit myself. It looked like a man walking up the side one foot in front of the other. But this man had hair. I just thought it was a bear and didn't think much of it because it was moving away from our campsite. We finished setting up and went to bed. At about one in the morning, I woke up to some rustling out by my truck. Oh yeah, by the way, my cooler was in the back of the truck and we planned to stay out there for about a week. But as I was saying, I heard something rustling around near my truck. I just thought that it was my buddy out getting ready for the day until I looked at his cot and he was still passed out. I woke him up and we decided to just stay in the tent until whatever was outside went away. We listened as this creature threw our cooler out of the back of the truck. After about ten minutes of listening to this, I finally got fed up with what was going on, so I grabbed my hunting rifle. At this point, both of us were active duty military and I left the tent from the back so I didn't just run right out the front and scare this animal. I got out and made my way to the corner of the tent. I flew around the corner using my training and turned on the mounted flashlight. The second I turned the light on, I saw this thing shoot up away from the cooler. I won't lie. I have been deployed before, and I have had bullets flying all around me. But this scared me to the point where I almost dropped my rifle. I got a great look at the face during the couple. Minute altercation. It had the face of a man and the feet of a man, but the body kind of looked like an oversized gorilla. It had no neck, kind of a conical head. It looked like the Bigfoot from the Patterson film. The standoff lasted about five minutes, and this thing dropped on all fours and ran so fast I have never seen something move that fast. I was driving on an unpaved back, country road at about 15th. Suddenly there was something in front of my driver's side headlight. I didn't see it until it was there. 
I didn't see it until it was there. I didn't see it running across the road. It was like it just showed up, poof. It was traveling to the left. I caught that glimpse of it and then it was gone. I had hit the brakes when I saw it, so I was then going around 20 meth and looked in the direction. It went and saw nothing. It was flat, salt, grass prairie with no trees, so I should have been able to see it. At the time, with the knowledge I had, the only name I had for it was Werewolf. Now I would call it Dogman. It was a bipedal black wolf. Its legs were really skinny, backwards looking, and it was hunched over so that the arms hung low. It was at least five feet tall, bent over like it was. If it was standing, I would guess it would gain at least a foot and a half. It had a thick torso, but not too thick, with long hair like a small cape, across the shoulders and upper back, down to the end of shoulder blades. The rest of its body was covered with short hair, or almost hairless. It had a shaggy tail. My grandfather and his brother had a scary experience in East Tennessee in the early 20s. In their case, it appeared to be an old man, and it was encountered around sunset as they were walking home from working on the farm. My grandpa said they passed the old man standing by the side of the road. Seeing he was clearly a stranger to the area, they tipped their caps to say hello, but the man just stared at the ground and didn't acknowledge them. They looked at each other and shrugged, kept walking. Then they heard a really weird sound behind them that made them turn. I asked them both on multiple occasions to try to describe or recreate the sound, but neither could. When they looked at the old man, they saw the same person they'd just passed, only completely different. They couldn't really explain that either, just said he was different. Bigger, taller, darker, something they couldn't adequately describe. But he was no longer looking at the ground. He was looking straight at them and had very bright blue eyes that my grandpa said took up his whole face. When I was about eight or ten years old, I saw Bigfoot. It was on Green Mountain near Huntsville, Alabama. It was unpopulated then. Now there are million-dollar homes there. I was on my way home from my uncle's house on a gravel road. I was on one side of a hill. The road went down this hollow and back up the other side. In the ditch line was Bigfoot, about eight feet tall, with arms that looked like they reached down past his knees. It was slightly leaned forward, looking straight at me. It scared the daylights out of me. So I went back to my uncle's house and told him. He got his shotgun and we went back. He was still there, looking at us. Uncle threw up the gun to shoot and I told him we needed to get closer. So we went down the hill and as we did, we lost sight. When we got back up the other side, it was gone.